All right. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. As always, as we say every week, it's a blessing. We have to count it a blessing uh, to be able to come together and to get in the word together. Count it a distinct honor uh, to be able to do this. And I'm excited about this. Listen, tonight is going to be, uh, tonight's going to be fun. I think it's going to be informative, but I think this is an important uh, topic to really delve into and to discuss. And so just give me a moment as we prepare to launch. We generally give folks a little bit of time to uh, jump in and, and to get online and to share and so forth. And so we're going to do that. And so for all of you who are here, we we thank God for you, for your faithfulness. Um, and if you could just be so kind as to let somebody know we're here, uh, hit the share button, hit the like button. That goes a long way in, um, in supporting what we are doing here. And so You'd be so kind, just do that. Give me one second. I'm just going to share this out as we get started. It is our prayer. It is our prayer that your week thus far was a good one, a productive one. Uh, we just pray that the Lord has been faithful and continuing to 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 go before you. Uh, so we're just prayerful that that is your reality uh, this week. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So give me a second. We're just sharing it out here. Praise God. And so tonight we're going to, uh, tonight we're going to talk about a topic that I believe is, well, it, it, this topic is very important. Uh, this topic is very important. And uh, I don't know how you feel about it. I don't know what your sentiment is about this topic, but, you know, uh, I believe that it's going to be a blessing. I really do. And if, if, if you, if you are following our page, uh, if you're following our, our, our Fountainside page, you, you are well aware, uh, you are well aware of what we are tackling today. And so I hope your heart and your mind is ready to really take this on tonight. So tonight we're going to talk about, as you see in the title, I'm talking like it's not in the title, it's right there in the title. So tonight we're talking about the end times. We're talking about the end times and we're talking about what that means what that means for us, the end times and what it means for us. Just grateful to everybody who is already here, Faye Dunn, uh, Evangelist Violet Thomas, uh, uh, my baby sister, Danita Apata, uh, Georgia Thomas, thank God for all of you and those who will be joining hereafter. So tonight we wanna talk about the end times and what that means for you, the end times, and what that means for you. I think this is a topic that for some, it is one of great consternation. Uh, for some, it is, it is a topic that brings uh, concern and it brings anxiety uh, when we talk about the end times. Uh, but, you know, something I think that is uh, evidently clear and is becoming more and more clear every single day. We are absolutely unequivocally in the end times. And that's why this topic is important because we, I want us to take some time to really look through the scriptures and to really understand what the word is saying about the end times so we can have a proper approach in our personal lives. Uh, and so that we are not taken uh, by surprise by what we see, by what we hear, by, um, Uh, by what we experience. 
And so let's open in prayer, then we're going to dive right in. Father, we thank you tonight that we can be here in this fashion to, to study your word. We thank you for your word. Uh, you have not left us powerless. You have not left us ill-informed. But you have given us your word that we would have understanding, that we would have clarity, that we would have peace. And so, Father, as we look into your word and uh, specifically on this topic of the end times, grant your people the appropriate understanding. Grant your people revelation knowledge. Grant your people a word that would strengthen them, that would encourage them, that would bring them into the knowledge of you, bring forth fruit unto righteousness. And for this, we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we want to talk about the end times. And I want to start off here with just a generalized uh, question. When you hear the term end times, what does that mean to you? When you hear that, what does that mean to you? What does it mean? End times. We don't lead to charge by saying the return of the Lord. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. The return of the Lord. When Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ coming is closer, uh, that's First Lady Dr. Ruth. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to talk about today. The return of Christ and what all that means, what we're seeing today, and what the word says about it. That's what we're going to delve into today. Now, uh... We're going to start here at Revelation chapter one. And the goal tonight is just to get through the first three chapters and, I, and that we should be able to cover all the grounds that way. Uh, God bless you, Anisha White. Thank you for joining us tonight. Amen. So Revelate, we are talking about the end times and what it means to us. And actually, let me ask that. What does the end times mean to you? Let me ask that real quick. Let's let's just shoot out questions or shoot out the answers real quick. What does what does the end times mean? What does the end times mean to you? What does the end times mean to you? When you think about the end times, you think about the end, you think about the book of Revelation and all that the book of Revelation uh, uh, reveals to us. What does the end times mean to you? We know it's the return of Christ, the coming of the second coming of the Lord. And, and what does that mean to you? We see here, uh, First Lady Dr. Ruth says, increased violence, disasters. Sure enough, and we're going to get into that, if not today, in the weeks to come. Absolutely. Looking forward to going home to be with God for eternity. Faye Dunn, thank you for that. That's 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 definitely something that's gonna be a beautiful that's gonna be a beautiful day. But first of all, Dr. Ruth says the word of God being preached all over. The Bible does say that. Even angels will preach the gospel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. And so Revelation chapter one, and look at what the words here says. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, referring to John the Baptist, John, John, sorry, John, uh, not the Baptist, John the Revelator, as we call him. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. 
who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And of all things that he saw. Blessed is blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We're reading Revelation chapter 1, and we're at verse 6. We're at Re Revelation chapter 1, and we are at verse 6. And six says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And Jesus says that in verse eight, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And I, John, who am I, and I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a, as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and to, and unto some, and unto uh, uh, Smyrna and unto, and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and, un, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lamp, seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flaming fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And Jesus says in verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. So we want to dive here into chapter one, and then what we're going to do tonight is we're going to just look at the seven churches and we're going to receive and really uh, uh, dissect what, what the message is that the Lord is sending to us. And to our earlier question, I asked, what is the end times and what does it mean to you? Uh, I see um, uh, Faith Dunn and Armageddon, the final battle, indeed, uh, uplifted heart. Thank you for joining. She says significant signs outlined in the Bible that mentions what will take place before the return of Christ, wars and rumors of wars. Amen. 
Amen. Good evening, Brother Roger. Thank you for joining my brother and the Fountainside family who is here directly. Thank God for you. So we're so I want I, I want to parse through chapter one real quick. And I want you to pick up on a few things. First of all, what is the purpose of the book of Revelation? What is the purpose of this book? And the answer is in verse one of Revelation chapter one. What is the purpose of the book of Revelation? It's, it's in verse one. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. All right. When we talk about what the purpose of the book of Revelation is, the purpose is to reveal unto us what will come to pass. I call the book of Revelation futuristic history. That's what I call it. History generally is referred to what has happened in the past, but the book of Revelation gives us the future in, in historic context before it has even happened. It is futuristic history. Amen. Uplifted Heart says the purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal things to come. And that's what the word is saying here, that Jesus sent this word to John and thereby through 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 the various epochs of time, he 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 sent it also to us to 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 show to us what must come to pass. And look at verse one intently. I'm reading the King James Version because verse one also says, and he sent and signified it by his angels unto his servant John. He sent the Lord Jesus sent and signified it. Underline that word signified. That word signified means to make clear. That word signified in the Greek, it, it literally means to make clear and or to sound an alarm. To make clear and to sound an alarm. So when we talk about what is what is the purpose of the book of Revelation, Number one, it is to reveal to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. In other words, if you're not a servant of God, you ain't going to get this. It's for his servants. We are his servants, not particularly pastors or evangelists or, or teachers per se, the believers, the body of Christ as a whole. And then, and, and, and then verse one says, Jesus sent it and signified it. The word signified again means to sound an alarm. Why is this important? Why is, what does this mean? This idea of sounding an alarm. The word is teaching us that God is saying, look, pay attention to this. This is a warning. Pay, pay attention to this. The alarm is being sounded. Be alert, be aware, be prepared. The Lord sent this and he signified it. He sent this alarm by his angel unto his servant, John. And then look at verse three. And my question born out of verse, verse, verse three is this. How does, how does thinking about the book of Revelation make you feel? How does thinking about the book of Revelation make you feel and uh uplifted heart was kind of ahead of the game and she said i she said it used to scare me when i was younger hit the like button or the love button or the laugh button whichever one you want to use whichever button you want to use if the book of revelation used to strike some some legitimate fear in your heart hit it if uh-huh yeah L let me know if that was you <laughs> Let me know that, and 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 I can join, I can join that concert. I, I, I'll tell you, what it was, I'll tell you what happened to me as a as a teenager. I it was it was during summertime, when we didn't have school, and, um, and I I fell asleep, maybe at like two o'clock in the afternoon and I woke up at maybe about five o'clock. And when I woke up, I fell asleep, people were home. And then, and then when I woke up, 
the house was eerily quiet. It was still, you can hear a pin drop. It was just so quiet in the house. And when I woke up, it's like where the sun was going down, it hit some clouds that made the entire house red. Like the entire, all I saw was red light beaming all over into the house. And I, and I get up and I don't hear my baby sister. I didn't, I didn't hear her making noise. I didn't hear my parents. I didn't hear my brother. I hear nobody. And I'm like, what in the world? I'm like thinking, did there, like, did the rapture just happen? <laughs> I was like, hold on a minute. I said, did the rapture? Because I don't hear nobody. And it was just so quiet, which it never happened in, in, in our house. And then everything is just so red. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I think the rapture just, just happened. You know, I went right back to the book of Revelation. Everything that the book of everything I said, Lord have mercy. How how is this how is this possible? You know, so yes, I've I've been there. I have been there. Uh where the book of Revelation would really strike some fear and some some consternation in, in the heart. I hear others here in, in the chat saying, uh, first study says uh, the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation puts me on guard, encourages me to do better. Amen to that. And she says, I love, I love the book of Revelation. Oh, this chat. Sorry, the chat is fading on me. So I love the book of Revelation. I was never fearful of that book. Well, God bless you, because when I was younger, I was. So yeah, I think for many, the, the book of Revelation, and I talk to a lot of people, they say, I don't even touch the book of Revelation. They don't even, they don't, they, 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 they don't even broach the topic of the book of Revelation. But as we see here in the word, the Bible is saying in verse three of Revelation chapter one, blessed is he that readeth and that and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for that time is at hand. You could you could go ahead and you, 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 you can highlight and circle verse three. If you embrace what, what the book of Revelation is saying, you are blessed. If you hear the words of this prophecy and you keep those things that are therein, you are blessed because the word, because the, because the Lord is saying that time is at hand and then we see in uh in verse uh, five look at verse five it refers to jesus as a faithful witness the first begotten of the dead the prince of the kings of earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood the word, the word is reminding us of who jesus is and then look at verse seven. It says, it, referring to Jesus, the Bible says, behold, he cometh with the clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Can somebody explain to me who is going to see him and why will they be wailed? Who's going to see him? And why are they going to be wailing, crying, and, and, and weeping? Why are they going to be wailing? Why are they going to be wailing? Honestly, those, those who did not accept Jesus Christ, indeed, indeed, indeed. Think about this in a practical present context. Think about this in a practical present context. Think about this in the context of the different belief systems that deny the existence of God. Atheism, relif uh, atheism relativism, humanism, selfism, the various religions that deny the deity of Christ. Think of all those who, who through different religions, through different philosophies, different teachings, they reject Christ. That's what the word is talking about here. They're going to wail. 
when they see him. They're going to cry when they see him because they'll realize this whole time they were wrong. You know, one thing that is interesting to me, and I, and I don't know if you've noticed this, there seems to be so much energy and effort into denying the reality of God. It It is, it is almost as if the resistance itself affirms the reality of God. The fact that people fight so hard to deny him. The fact that people fight so hard to fight against the idea of God, but it's okay. Islam is okay. Buddha is okay. The Quran is cool. It's all right. We can, we can respect that. Even with this new chat, GBGBT, somebody asked the ask the chat gbt um it said tell me something about islam and it, it would give a quote and then and then there it asked tell me something about christianity and and the chat gbt was programmed to essentially blaspheme christianity and blaspheme god there seems to be this aggressive push against god which serves to confirm that he indeed is real. And the book of Revelation here is giving us insight into how we need to be ready and what we need to do to be ready. And that's what we want to look at as we delve deeper here into the book of Revelation. Very quickly, look at verse nine of chapter one. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to see some things and then we're going to dive into the seven churches real quick. Verse nine, this is the seven who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ who is in the Isle of Patmos, in the Isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Real quick, notice, first of all, John is, John uh, is, John doesn't exalt himself. This John is the disciple that we read about through the gospels. That's who this John is. And he's not exalting himself because he has received this revelation. He says, I'm, he says, I am also your brother and your companion in this tribulation. He's not exalting himself, but he's, but he's saying, look, I'm just like you going through this, uh, 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 receiving this, receiving the revelation of what God is, is saying to us. It is an example or it is a reminder for us to remain humble no matter what God does through us, remain humble, stay humble. Also, also look at verse nine uh, and notice what he says. So he says, it's me, John, your brother and companion. He said, he said, I was in the aisle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So my question, why was John there? What does that mean? Was, was John there on a vacation? Was he there? He, I mean, it was an island. He, he must have been on the beach enjoying himself, right? Like, what does it mean when John says, I was in the aisle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ? Why? What is John saying in this verse? What is, what is John saying to us here in Revelation chapter 1, the second half of verse 9? Good evening to Donovan McKay. My uncle, God bless you all, uh, all the way from Delaware. God bless you, uncle. Thank you for joining. So first lady hit the nail on the head. John, John the Baptist here was not, was not on vacation. <laughs> no, he was exiled to the Isle Patmos for the word of God. In other words, he was persecuted for the word of God. Some secular historians of that day even uh, record that John was tortured by being boiled by by being boiled in a vat of hot oil. They 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 dipped his body in hot oil because he would not deny the faith. And and then they sent him to this secluded island by himself. 
And it was there in his persecution. It, it was there in the midst of all of this that he received this revelation from God. Listen, you could be in a bad place in God and God will speak to you and God will speak through you. Here was John being persecuted, literally being boiled in hot oil, but yet he was, yet he was still at a place where he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In other words, we can be going through stuff, but that is the best time to, to, to lock into God. And that is the best time to, to hear from God, just as John did. What if John went there angry and bitter? He would have never heard from God. But John went there saying, Lord, I need to hear from you. And the Bible, and he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. And there in that moment, he began to receive the revelation that would absolutely change the world for all time. So I don't know who this is for. You may be going through. You may be on your own Patmos somewhere. Maybe you've been exiled. Maybe you've been put through your own boiling oil uh, type of torture. But even in that season, God can still speak to you. And God can give you a word that will change you and the generations to follow. So that's why John was there. He wasn't there for no vacation. He wasn't. <laughs> He wasn't there for no vacation. And real quick, look at look at look at verse eleven. I I want you to see how the word ties together throughout the entirety of Scripture. Look at look at verse eleven. We got to hurry. Look at verse eleven. It says, "I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and last. What thou seest, write in the book and send it into the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and Thyatira, unto Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea." Uh, da 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 da. I'm sorry, and it's, it's not verse, I'm sorry, it's verse 16, sorry, verse 16. And look what Jesus says in verse 16, or, or what the word says in terms of John's description of Christ. He says, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth, watch this, uh, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, where have we seen this before in the scriptures? Where have we seen this before? We've seen it. I want you to turn with me real quick to Hebrews. I'm not talking about coffee. I'm talking about the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Some of y'all didn't get my Hebrews joke, but that's okay. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful. It is sharper than any what? Two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and it is a, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart Ooh, the Bible, so so the word is a two-edged sword out of the mouth of jesus came a two-edged sword also real quick jump to revelation chapter 19 jump to revelation 19 and verse 15 I want you to see how the Bible just coalesces together. Revelation 19 and verse 15 says, Out of the mouth, out of his mouth, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. You see how throughout Scripture we see that trend. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the word is sharp. It is, it is sharper than the two-edged sword. And then we read here, we read here in Revelation 1, 16, that out of his mouth came that two, out of, out of, out of, out of his mouth came that two-edged sword. And we read in Revelation 19, 15, that, that again, out of his mouth, the word of God was judging and ruling the land. In other words, the word has power. The word has has power. And when Jesus comes back, his authority will be in the word, the swords that leave his mouth. The word is teaching us. The book of Revelation is teaching us the power of the word. 
You got to get the word in your mouth. You got to get the word out of your mouth. Get the word in your heart. Get the word in your spirit. Get the word in your soul. And, and let it flow out of your mouth. And it will flow out like a sword. That whatever the enemy is trying to do, he can do what he want to do. But he will do it at his own detriment. Because out of your mouth, the word will come out of your mouth to judge and to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. Amen. Amen. All right, now. As we're reading about this, I want to ask you this question. What difference do you see between the Jesus in the Gospels and the Jesus that we're introduced to here? In the book of Revelation, what difference do you see? What difference do you see? Do you see a difference between the Jesus and the Gospels versus the Jesus that we read about here in the book of Revelation? What is the difference that you see? Okay, then says Jesus is the living word. Amen. Amen. He is the living word. Absolutely. What difference do you see here? Jesus says, fear not, I am the first and the last. This is verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. What difference do we see in the Jesus of the gospel? The difference that we see. And first, what he says here that Jesus in the Gospels was coming to teach about salvation and that he will return to judge. Evangelist Violet Thomas says the gospel, in the gospel, he is a savior. Ah, come on now. Come on now. Ah, Evangelist Violet, Th Evangelist Violet Thomas hit, hit, hit it right on the head. In the gospel, he is the savior. In Revelation, he is judge. I almost want to, I, I almost want to hit this table, but I'll, I'll shake this computer. My uncle Donovan McKay says, he is the risen Lord. Amen. Amen. This is the difference that we see. Jesus and the gospels came to bring grace and salvation and to offer life eternal. Jesus in Revelation is saying, I am coming to reward men. He's coming back as judge, the judge of all things. This is, and it's not that Jesus has changed, but he, has, but he is fulfilling exactly what he has promised. Amen. He's coming back as judge. This isn't the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. Uh -uh. No, no, no. It's not. No, no. This is this is Jesus, the righteous judge. People who say, well, how could they get away with it? Oh, hold on. They ain't getting away with it. He is coming back. How could God let that happen? Don't listen. He's coming back just, be, just because it didn't happen now. He's coming back. Every man will be judged. He's coming back. Trust me. People think just because a person's buried in the earth, they got away with it. <laughs> uh-uh. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. Now let's let's now let's look here at what the Lord says to the seven churches. This is important. The seven churches are important because it teaches us what God is saying to us. These God is sending a message to these seven churches. In other words, the se now in other words, the body of Christ. The number 7 is important in terms of theological numerology. The number of seven is important because it signifies completeness, wholeness. In other words, what God is about to say to the seven churches is his warning to the entire body of Christ. And the warning that God is sending, it is not to make us afraid, but it is to prepare us. It is to prepare us. That is the purpose of the warning. That is the purpose of the warning. 
So let's let's look here, and we're, we're going to start with Ephesus, so, uh, Re Re uh, Revelation two. Went to the angel, the church of Ephesus. Write these things. These things saith rather, he that holdeth the seven stars. Listen to what he says. Look at what. Listen to what the, the message God has for Ephesus and, and and for us today. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are, they are apostles and are not. Thou hast found them liars, and hast borne and patient, and, and hast patience. And for my name's sake hath labored, and, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, Jesus says in verse 4, Revelation 2, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest, the deeds of the Nicolote, the sorry, the, Nicol, the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, verse 7, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. To him that overcometh, I will give, I will give to eat the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, so based on this, what is the warning that God is giving to us through this, through the church of Ephesus? What, what do you believe the warning is that, that we can glean from this, this passage? What is the warning that you're gathering from this? Give you a second. I see here, uh, Dr. Ruth says that the church has become distracted and not putting God first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think in part, and as and y'all can contribute as I'm saying this for the sake of time, Ephesus, were, or, or um, yeah, Ephesus here was a church that did its job in making sure that doctrine was was right. They made sure that they fought against false teachings, right? They were doing that correctly. They made sure that they warred against the false teachings, the false doctrines, but. But but what we're seeing here is in in the midst of all that they were doing, rightfully so, in 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 bearing up proper doctrine. Jesus says, nevertheless, in verse four, thou hast left thy first love. In other words, they were strong in theology, but they were weak in relationship. They were strong in what they knew religiously, but they were weak in relationship. They defended the faith. They defended proper doctrine. But, but, Jesus says, thou hast left thy first love. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, that fire that you once had, it is gone. That passion that you had, it is, it's, 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 it's gone. It was, it was diminished. The, the early days of their faith with the zeal was hotter than a furnace heated seven times hotter, gone. And Jesus warns them and therefore warns us not to get so, not to only be focused on being religiously correct, doctrinally correct, theologically correct. But the word is saying, be mindful not to become so religious that, that we lose relationship. We have to be careful not to become a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, so theologically astute to the extent where we lose our relationship. Jesus says, look, it's time to come back to your first love. Or else Jesus says, I will, I will remove your candlestick. And so that's the lesson that we learn from Ephesus. Now, 
the Lord then speaks to the church in Smyrna. Verse 9, he says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are the Jews and are and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. But if thou, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. What do you believe the lesson here is? The message or the, the warning that God is giving or the encouragement that God is giving to the church in Smyrna. And just for some context, Smyrna here, Smyrna was a church that was being persecuted by the Jews. They were being persecuted historically. We are we learned that Smyrna was a church that was being persecuted by the Jews. And there is a, there is a historical uh, martyrdom called the martyrdom of Polycarp, where where, where Christians were 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 murdered for and killed for their faith. And this is who Jesus is writing to. And this is an example of what may be, what will be coming our way. That in fact, right now there are those working on trying to make the Bible hate literature. There are people who view the Bible as hate literature and they want to make it legally hate literature. They want to bring persecution. And therefore the message from Jesus to Smyrna and the message to us is to be prepared to be persecuted. Jesus says in verse nine, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. In other words, yes, all this is happening to you and, 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 and maybe there isn't a lot of money in the bank, but you are rich. And the Lord is encouraging them and therefore encouraging us, don't be afraid of the things that thou would suffer. Behold, we will be thrown in prison. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. But be thou faithful unto death and God said, I will give thee a crown of life. God is saying, look, do not deny me. And I will give you a crown of life. And then Jesus sends a message to Pergamos. Look at, look at chapter two, verse 12. Look at verse 12 of chapter two. Amen. Faye Dunn says, serve the Lord no matter what circumstances, and God will reward you. Absolutely. Don't, don't, don't give up on God. Do not give up on God. Don't give up on. And to Pergamos, listen to the message here. I know thy works where thou, says, I know thy works and where, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast to my name and, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where, where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I, have, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. And so has, and in verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that ever hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, saith to the church. What is a message here to Pergamos? What is a message here to Pergamos? What is the message here that you see to Pergamos? Like this. 
first of all, we see that Pergamos is a church that is sitting and operating in a place where they, they are literally in the enemy's camp. That's why Jesus says, you are literally at the seat where Satan dwelleth. In other words, we can be in places in life where we are literally in the mix of demonic forces. And that is where this church was, but they were faithful. But the problem is, even though they were faithful at large to what God had called them to do, even though they were faithful in large to what God had called them to do and called them to say, Jesus is saying, hold on, but there are some of you that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Not that they were particularly teaching it, but that they were holding the doctrine of Balaam. But then they taught, but those who held that, then they taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idol, idols, and to commit fornication. And so what Jesus is warning Pergamos of is he's warning them of, of compromise. He's warning them about compromise. Saying that, yes, you're holding on, but there's something that you're doing here that you need to be aware of. You are allowing this to slip in. You are, you are allowing this to slip in. You got those holding this doctrine that is demonic to cast to cast a stumbling block. And the message to us, therefore, is as Christians, the message to us as Christians is, look, we can't afford to compromise. Pergamos was holding it down. They were holding on, but they let certain things slip in. And Jesus says, repent or else I will come quickly. Don't miss this. The Lord is saying there's no space for compromise, y'all. There's no space for compromise. There is no space for compromise. Like what my uncle says, that's why he said he will take the church out of the church. You gotta take the compromise out. And one thing that we're seeing today is we are seeing illicit compromise being completely embraced. The Lord is saying, hold on, be careful of what you're letting in. Be careful. Know the word. Read the word. Get in the word and stick with the word. If it, if, if it, is, if it is outside the parameters of the word, leave it alone. If it's not in the word, leave it alone. You don't need to bathe your daughter in blue, blue water to heal her. Leave it alone. That's not in the Bible. You don't need to put a black stone in the corner of your house to keep spirits out. It's not in the word. Don't play with it. You don't, you don't need to walk around burning sage to ward off evil spirits. It is not in the word. Don't play with it. Don't play with it. Don't play with it. Quickly, look at, look at, look at Thyatira. Chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things. I know thy works, thy charity, and thy service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, Jesus says, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her space to repent, of her fornication, and she repented not, behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with, with, with death, and all the church shall know that I am he, which searches the reins and the heart, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Oof. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. What is God saying to Thyatira? It's quite clear. And notice the trend in all these churches. These churches are doing good things. But he says, I, but, but notwithstanding, I, I, I have a few things against you, God says. So we have to look in our lives. Okay, I'm doing these things right. All right I got this. I got this. But, but, but is there anything in my life that needs to be changed or cleaned up, right? 
that's a trend that we're seeing here. Let's not just think, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm good. And then and then we're not we're not searching ourselves. We're not we're not checking ourselves. Uh-uh. No, no, no. We got to check ourselves. That's what God is doing here. He's saying, look, y'all are doing good, but hey, hold up, watch this. Y'all are doing good, but hold on, this is holding you back. Right? And so here, the Lord warns Thyatra about Jezebel. He warns them about Jezebel. A woman who they are, or, or, or a person, because it could be a Jezebel spirit, it doesn't have to be a woman specifically. But this individual who calleth herself a prophetess, no, notice she calleth her, herself. Be, care, be careful of self-proclaimed individuals who make themselves what they want to be. Self-proclaimed. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a this, I'm a that. Really? You're self-proclaimed? The Bible says... Anybody who is going to be ordained in any office, let the elders come together, lay hands on you, and pray for you. You can't just you can't just anoint yourself. <laughs> All right. Oh Lord. And they suffered her. They allowed her to teach and to seduce my the servants of God to commit fornication and to eat things a sacrifice to idols. And God said, I gave her space to repent. In other words, God is saying, Look at my mercy. I gave her space to repent. But she would not. And people struggle with verse 23. He said, I, I will kill her children with death. God isn't just out there to kill children. In other words, these individuals were rebelling against God. That's why God said, I, I will give unto every you according, give unto every one of you according to your works. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what the Lord says to Sardis. We're almost done. I want you to get this. Look here at what the Lord says to Sardis in chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord says this, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. And if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Either he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear. So what is God saying to Sardis? Notice, no, notice verse 2. That's that's verse 2 of chapter 3 is a bombshell passage. He says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and that are ready to die, for I have for I've found thy works. I, I have not found thy works perfect before God. God is saying, look, there are, there are areas that are dying. Be watchful and strengthen those areas. For I, he's saying, be watchful and strengthen the areas that are ready to die. That's the challenge. If there are any areas in your life that are suffering spiritually, God is saying, be watchful, pay attention, be watchful, and strengthen those things. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not praying like I should. You got to strengthen those things. I'm not reading the word as I should. Strengthen those things. I'm not walking in the love of God as I should. Strengthen those things. I'm not worshiping like I used to. Strengthen those things. I don't fast anymore. Strengthen those things that remain and that are ready to die. In other words, it ain't dead yet. So strengthen those things. Oof, what a message. Strengthen it. Be encouraged. It ain't dead. So just, come on, just strengthen it. Get back to prayer. Get, get back to the word. Jump, get over there in your bookshelf and dust off the Bible. Strengthen those things that remain. Because God says, look, if you don't, I'm going to show up as a thief in the night. You won't know the hour which I'll come. I'll just, I'll just be there and it'll be too late. So he's saying to Sardis and he's saying to us, strengthen those things which remain. Look at Philly, 
Philadelphia. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right. I know that I works, verse 8. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which is to come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly and hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. This is this is big. Philadelphia is the one church. Philadelphia is the one church of all the churches that did not receive a rebuke from God. They didn't receive a rebuke from God because they kept his word. And, and God said, I will, I will, I will open a door that no man can shut. You see, when we commit to God, God will open doors that no man can shut. He said, I will, I will, I will leave that door open and no man can shut, no matter what they do, no matter what, no, no, no matter what witchcraft they try, no matter what they try, then they will not be able to move the doors that I open for you. Just remain faithful. I'm talking to that person who is tired. And notice, God said, God, God said, I will open the, you know, I, I, God said, I set before thee an open door that no man can shut it. Why? Why? Because God says, for thou hast a little strength. Thou hast a little strength. God is talking to those who are weary in holding on. God is saying, continue to hold on. I'm going to open a door that no man can shut in your life. Praise the Lord. Very quickly, we have one more, Laodicea, and we're done. And unto the church of the Laodiceans, verse 15, Jesus says, I know thy works. Keep in mind, everything that we have read, this is Jesus speaking. This is not John speaking. This is Jesus speaking to us. And unto the church in Laodicea, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, I, I worked Sorry, I would I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee, I counsel thee to buy of me gold. Tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that, the, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, what is the message here that God is sending to the Laodiceans and therefore to us? I think this church is the closest picture to the Western church today. Laodicea is a representation of the church and the body of Christ in North America or nations that have wealth. Pay attention to what the Lord is saying here to the Laodiceans and to us. God is saying, I know your works. In other words, they're doing things for God. But watch this. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. So God is saying, you're doing the works, but you ain't hot and you, you're not hot, you're not cold. You're doing it, but you're lukewarm. You're in it, but you're not really in it. And God says, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And what causes this lukewarm nature? Verse 17. 
Look at verse 17 of chapter 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and am increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And God said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. God is saying, look, I'm trying to get you to a place where you get the real thing, gold tried with fire, that thou mayest be truly rich and white raiment so that way you may be clothed and, and that your nakedness would be and your shame would not appear. And then God says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve. In other words, we are not dousing our eyes with the anointed word of God. Our vision is dried and cracked and blurred. The Lord is warning the church about the comfort that is born out of riches. And, and you're going to say, well, look, I ain't rich. I don't have a six bedroom house. I'm not rich. I'm not driving a Maybach. I'm not driving a, a, a I'm, I'm not a millionaire. No, no, no. Listen, people, he, even people in this country who earn $30,000, $25,000, they are rich compared to other people in the world. And maybe in society, we set the bar of wealth so high that people are miserable if, if they're not at that bar, but they have more than, more, than, more than a lot of people. And so the word is warning us. Jesus himself is saying, look, be careful because the trappings of society can make a person lukewarm. It can make a person lukewarm. Yeah, you're doing the works, but you're not hot and you're not cold. You're just sitting in the middle. I want you to read through these two chapters in your in your own time. And maybe God will speak some more things to you. I want to start here tonight so we can get the baseline of what of where God is going in the book of Revelation. And I want and I want you to join me next week because we're going to begin to look at. We're not going to go through the entirety of the book of Revelation. We're going, to, we're going to move systematically through Revelation. And we're going to look at specific things that are prevalent to where we are today so we can get a snapshot of what God is saying to us. And so, and, and, and so, and, and so that we can live our lives with this in mind. And this is important because the truth of the matter is it is easy to become uh, busy with life. Maybe the kids, and you're doing this, you're doing that, and, and work, and your career, right? Uh, the different goals that you have. And sometimes we can end up losing sight of the fact that we need to stay prepared. We lose sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back, that everything is pointing to the return of Christ, and that nothing else matters in reference to that. So it's okay to be doing what we're doing. It's okay to be progressing in our career. It's, it's okay to be doing what we do for our children, our spouse, et cetera. But in all that we do, we must always bear in mind that every, and again, and you're going to hear me quote this uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, my late father, uh, uh, Bishop George uh, Thomas would say, listen, every minute that passes by, we are one minute closer to the return of the Lord. And so, yes, we're doing all that we're doing. We're graduating, we're progressing, we're blah, 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 we're doing it. But in all that we do, we must remember that we are one minute closer to the, to, to the return of the Lord, and therefore, we must be ready. And so, for the weeks to come, we are going to look at the revelation that we read in Revelation, what we learn, how we can apply it to our lives, and, and we are going to learn what it means to us, and we are also going to take stock of what we are seeing today that is being fulfilled by this futuristic history. And so I encourage you tonight, receive in your soul the warning that God is giving to us, the church. Go through the seven churches again and say to yourself, where am I in that? Read, read again through Revelation Two and three, those two chapters cover the seven churches. Read through it and ask yourself, okay, is that me? Is that me? Have I allowed doctrine that's not scriptural to become doctrine in my life? Is that me? Is that me? Have I become lukewarm? Is that me? 
Have I been listening to Jezebel-esque teachers and preachers? Is that me? And they're out there, people telling you that, you know, the whole word of faith movement, the whole prosperity gospel movement, foolishness, absolute garbage, absolute garbage. And the amount of Christians that are running behind these people, giving their last, because if I give this much, God's going to give me a house. Foolishness. These are the ones and these are the warnings that God is saying, let us make sure that we are not a part of that. So go ahead and read through Revelation 2 and, and the Revelation 3. Evaluate yourself and ask God to reveal to you areas that, that where he, ask God to reveal to you areas where he's saying to you, listen, change that or else I'll remove your candlestick. Change that. And listen, what I love about Revelation, and I'm finished here, what I what 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 I love about Revelation is that God is lovingly sending us a warning. And God is saying, I want you to be ready. So God is saying, watch out for this, watch out for that, watch out for that, and watch out for this. God is saying, this is what I need you to pay attention to. Because when I come back, these areas need to be right. So God, so God is not leaving us unawares. God is saying, look, I told you what I expect. This is what I expect. So evaluate your life. Evaluate your heart. And let's make sure we are ready. Amen. Let me close. We are over time. Let me close in prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. And while this word is challenging, sobering, I pray, God, that you convict our hearts. Convict our hearts unto righteousness. Convict our hearts unto change. Convict our hearts unto transformation. And help us to receive of you the revelation and the conviction of your spirit that we would be able to make the appropriate changes. Father, bring to the forefront the areas that we need to change. Bring to the forefront the areas that we have been ignorant of, the areas that we have been ignoring. Have mercy on us. And Father, bring it forth that we would be ready in full. Convict us of sin. Convict us of our areas of rebellion. Convict us, God, where we have lost count and have lost track. Convict us, O oh God, regarding things that we maybe have become comfortable in. Convict our hearts today and make us ready. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, on behalf of the entire Fountainside family and First Lady Dr. Ruth McLeod, I want to thank you all for joining us. Please join us next week as we continue. Don't be afraid and stay away now. We were talking about Revelation. I'm scared. No, no, no. You need to hear what God is saying to us, the church, so we can all collectively be ready. And listen, if this has been a blessing, hit the share button. Hit that share button. Uh, visit our uh, visit our, our our YouTube channel in about thirty minutes. You'll see this entire teaching available on YouTube. You can send it to your friends, send it to your kids, uh, nieces, nephews, etc. They need to know that God is coming back, and we need to be ready. We love you. God bless you. We're praying for you. And Lord Terry's and spares. We will be back with you next week. Again, on behalf of First Lady Dr. Ruth and the entire Fountainside family, we love you. Lord Terry, we'll see you next week. Take care.